Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody and welcome to another awesome episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. I am sorry I did not do an episode last week, but I have a really, really good excuse. I was in Philadelphia and I went up last Tuesday and two weeks ago I discussed a little bit about a collection that I was trying to work a deal on and I ended up making the deal And I went up to a friend of the show, John Keating, that 70s card show, to his house. We we did the deal and we spent all day Tuesday looking through the collection. Uh, Another person who got in on it with us was Chris Sewell, who on YouTube is Baseball Collector Investor Dealer. And we're calling it the Grail Collection because there are so many cards that people would consider Grails in their collection. That's why we dubbed it that name. And it has been a blast over the last week getting all the cards and then kind of sorting through them. And uh, I'm sitting here sorting 1968 tops and putting them in a binder to start building a set for that. It is. It was just an amazing experience, kind of one of those dream scenarios that all collectors would love to have the opportunity to do. And I was blessed to, to be able to partake in that. And so I apologize for no episode last week. But this week, I'm going to make up for it because I've got a guy on today as my guest that I consider a hobby friend. He and I have never met in person. Uh, he may correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think so. But we we share, we're kindred spirits because we both had our right shoulders operated on. He's had a few more than me. We may talk about that a little bit. I'm going to bring him on right now. And it is Mark Hoyle from Mark Hoyle's Impossible Dream. Hey, Mark. How you doing, Mike? I'm good. Welcome to the show. Honored to be on here. I have to say, you're the first vintage card podcast that I listened to when I found all this stuff. Oh, wow. Know, six or seven years ago, maybe, when I started. I'm really sorry um, that I had to be here. You, you learned quickly that there's better stuff out there, I'm, and I'm glad that you found that. Um, it's all thank good. you. I'm glad you found it. And uh, We've been friends for a while, kind of on the periphery a little bit. We're, we're friends. We have a lot of mutual friends, for yes, sure. Yes, we do. Yes, yes. And from afar, I have heard the legend of Mark Hoyle. Um, I'm <laughs> not going to lie to you. Yeah. Well, your, your hobby knowledge is well known, and that's what I'm hoping to bring to the table here. I'm excited that my, that my audience gets to hear you talk about it. Um, when were the first packs that you opened? Do you remember? Uh, the ones I remember opening a 71. That's the first time I remember opening packs, but I had, I have cards in my collection from 69 that I've had since I was a little kid. So I must've opened those packs. I just don't remember 69 and 70. I don't remember those. The, uh, the place I got my cards was the only store in town and my mother worked at the store. So I would go, I was obsessed with baseball as a six and seven year old kid. So I was, I was getting packs young. And then once her salesman knew that her kid collected cards, he would hand an extra box to her sometimes when he walked into the store. Oh, wow. And that, that continued all the way through college for me. Even after I was out of college, he still brought in cards. At that point, it was a set he would give to me. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's, you know, it's a, a good memory. Good memory. Did you ever get, did they ever give you vending boxes or anything or just boxes, boxes, just, just boxes with wax packs. And it wasn't just baseball. He did it for every sport. Um, so you could open, you know, hockey sets for 132 cards. You could easily get a set out of a box. You know, I was the, uh, all the other kids in school were jealous. Cause I had, I already had my set done Christmas time. I'm done. Over with. <laughs> so 
people that don't know you, you're a Red Sox mega super ultimate. I don't even, there's not a superlative that I could add to the front of collector to make it worthy of what you do uh, in terms of Red Sox. Do you still have all those old cards that you, the hockey stuff and the weird? I still do. I still do. I don't actively collect the other three sports. Uh, occasionally somebody will hit me up. Hey, do you want some Bruins cards? I'll take them. I don't buy, buy them anymore though. It's just, it's a space issue. As you probably know, you just can't, you just can't do it. Um, but I'm I do well have all the sets all, all through the seventies. I have football, I think 73 to 80 and that's about 71 to 80 for hockey. Um, I had other partial sets, but I just unloaded stuff last year. I had to lighten the load here. It's just too much, too much. So what got you good, just going on the focus of Red Sox, everything, Red Sox, everything you could get your hands on. What started that? Uh, as a kid, I was a set collector, which probably most of us were in the seventies. There was one set to collect and that's what you focused on. Uh, I never completely got out. I got married young. I had two boys. They were both into the cards. We went to shows. So I would pick up stuff here and there. And then when I really got back into it, probably 2010, I was popping around one day on a Saturday afternoon. It was raining. I found all these blogs and it's like, Hey, there's other guys that are my age that collect cards. And they write about it. So I I didn't know what a parallel was. There was all numbered cards. It was like all these different companies making cards. And it's like, I can't, I can't do this. Um, I'm just going to collect Red Sox, which I had already kind of started doing. When I went to the shows with my sons, that's what I would buy is Red Sox stuff. Like my Yastrzemski rookie, I bought it for 20 bucks in, you know, 1984 or something like that, you know. One of my Williams cards up there, I bought for like 40 bucks in 1985. Um, so when I got back into it full time, I noticed other guys were just doing player collections or team collections. So I just started working backwards and filled in the blanks. And, you know, I went back. The earliest socks that I have is 1906, the fan craze. And I still I buy the new stuff now. I just buy a team set. Uh, end of the year, I usually do the factory set. I, I decided last year that I'm not doing that anymore. I'm done buying it because those sit in that closet right there. They don't even get unboxed and they just sit there. So I just decided to do the Red Sox. And then once I, I kind of was, if I can't find a card, I'll, I'll buy a button. I'll buy a, I have commemorative cups all over this room. I have bumper stickers. I have a, I have a six inch binder behind me with 2000 different pocket schedules in it for Red Sox. So <laughs> it's it's a it's a fun it's a fun chase um i call myself the impossible dream that's one of the teams i collect where there was 39 guys who played on that team and i will collect anything from any one of those guys on any team they played on so that's where i get to figure out some of these oddball sets because i could be looking for a don mcmahon card with the indians so i'm digging into regional sets for the indians so then you just kind of remember all this stuff and you, you know, put it in your bank of knowledge. So, so that was 60, that was the 67 team, right? 67 team. They were, they were the team that turned it around. Um, yeah. They almost moved out of Boston 67 and wow. they, you know, they, they turned it around. Um, I do have some Boston Braves stuff too. Uh, obviously I don't remember them here, but my dad, my uncles, cousins, you know, they talked about it. So I have a little bit of a connection to those guys. So I have some Spawn stuff, some Eddie Matthews, but it's mostly Red Sox. And uh, it's a little bit of everything. I probably have, in this room I'm in right now, I probably have uh, 800 pins on display where you can see at any time when you walk in here. As you, it's like, you know, they're just packed. The shelves are packed. So, Well, we when we got the Grail collection, John Keating, who is a, a very good friend of yours, and I were, yep. were hunting for something that you might need. <laughs> and it was it that was our impossible dream was trying yeah. to <laughs> we were like well i think he hit you up with he sent me a message too probably right after you and it's like i'm like john where are you and uh i asked him for a couple cards i was looking for there's a few guys i need but they didn't happen to be in it so um you know next time well, the next grail we would have happily 
added them to your collection and would have been honored to find something that you needed. Uh, but it was so much fun, you know, as you know, just digging, digging around and what's, what's around the next corner. That's, that's most of the fun of collecting, right? Is what can you possibly find? Right. And you just, so do you, when you go to a show, what's your strategy? Are you asking guys for particular cards? What Red Sox stuff do you have? How do you handle that? Um, the, there's a couple of big, there's, there's a show here twice a year. It's a big Boston show. Um, I know a lot of the dealers. A lot of times I have a deal worked out before I get there. I've already emailed these guys. I walk right in, go to the table, get my stuff. I have a small list. There's a few cards that I am looking for. Other than that, it's just whatever catches my eye. Because um, it's not just cards. It's press photos. I collect bumper stickers. As long as it's vintage, I'll, I'll grab it. So, uh, And you're in the yeah, area where you can find that stuff, right? Are you talking about the right, Fenway right. show that you that you go to twice a year? Or is it a there's a Fenway show? show, which is two or three times a year. Then there's a big show. Uh, Rich Altman, I don't know if he does them out near you too. Um, he runs, well, he passed away, but he ran one in Boston. Um, but, you know, there, there's, if you grow up in New England, everybody saved everything here. So stuff's always popping up. Um, you know, uh, every, like I said, everybody saved everything. So I, I've never actually found anything on the job. I do construction for a living. And I'm hoping to find that box in the attic, but it have never happened. I found one boxing card from 1920. That's all I've ever found. But there's, there's a good group of dealers around here that are local. And uh, a couple, there's a lot of card shops. So I hit those up maybe once every other Friday. I walk in and if he takes something in, a lot of times I get a phone call before he puts it out. So do you need this? So it helps, you know. And uh, as long as you're not kicking the tires all the time and beating the guy down, he's going to continue to do it. So I found some good stuff that way. You know? Have you gone down the road of tickets, of game yes. tickets? Yes, I had. I started trying to get one ticket from every game in 1967. I'm at about 40 right now, plus the World Series tickets. Um, I don't know if I'll complete that one. That's a uh, that's a hard task. Uh, I have a few tickets from 75 series. Um, I think my oldest one is just I have one from the 46 World Series, but I'm I'm trying to get one each for each game in 67 which to me tough to me one of the most tragic things is that ted williams never won a world series right? Right, right and as good of a player as he was to not carry a team he tried to in 46 right um, yeah i think he, he was hurt during that series too so he didn't even have a good series um right they had some good says, teams. they went down to the wire a couple other times with the yankees but they just couldn't get over the hump couldn't do it yeah do you have Yankee toilet paper? <laughs> no, no, I don't. No, no, no Yankee toilet paper. No, but so, I do. Unfortunately, oh, Sparky Lyle is one of the guys who played on 67 teams. So I have a lot of Yankee Sparky Lyle stuff. Good Doesn't point. Get, it's not displayed, but I have it. <laughs> to, <laughs> just to say you have it. Yeah. One of my favorite movies is the, um, the Red Sox movie. I just went totally blank on what it's called. Drew Barrymore and yeah, I forgot the name of that too. Fever. Oh my gosh, Fever Pitch is the Fever name Pitch. of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love that movie, and you remind me of him, an, an older version of him. What his room would look like if he actually collected memorabilia. Yeah. Do you do you dress in Red Sox stuff every day to work, or you know? No, 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 no. I, although the guys that work for me know I collect. So one of the guys went to the game opening day. I. I was going to go, but I had some family issues and they did a ceremony for Tim Wakefield. So I went to work today and that guy, he brought me, he gave me the pin that he got at the game that everybody nice. got. So I, uh, yeah, they, a lot of the guys know I collect. So they, they pick up stuff if they go. Yeah. I don't have, I'm not a guy who wears Red Sox shirts all the time. I mean, the shirt I have on now is from Hinchcliffe stadium. It's a, a Negro league park in New York that just okay. got remodeled. So it's, it has a meaning to it. They raise some money with all these things. That is awesome. I just, I love how focused you are. And it, it doesn't mean you can't enjoy collecting if you're only collecting a team and you're, and you're at, you're at the 99%, you know, you're 99% done. 
that last one percent is the impossible dream part and it's it still gives you excitement for the hobby or do you yeah are you yeah. kind of bored with it no 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 because there's, there's still new stuff and there's always stuff turning up all the time but like the other day i watched you guys when you had your little show and even though none of that stuff was stuff i would collect it was fun to watch it um and i'm on twitter and i watch all the youtube channels i mean I can see Satchel Page. All you guys have those: Jackie Robinson, Mickey Mantle. And I enjoy watching what other guys collect. Um, and it's you know I, I don't have the fear of missing out on that. I just I just know that's not what I do. And yeah, it, it's fun to watch other guys. Like I'm happy for you guys. You got some killer cards. You got your Gary card. Um, the Babe Ruth got sold. Uh, it's yeah. it's fun to watch other guys get stuff to put into their collection. And I don't have to. I, there's no jealousy here. I have my stuff. You guys have your stuff. So the what I want people to hear that I'm hearing from you, the lesson there is to stay in your lane. If you have a collecting focus that you like, it's very easy to get taken up with what else is out there. But right. you've done a really good job of staying in your lane and saying, nope, this is what I'm focusing on. There's plenty of this out there. I can find it. And if I can't, I'll. It's okay. I'll just save up more money for the next thing, you know. That's it. Before we were on this today, I was already trying to work out a deal for some Tris Speaker exhibit cards that I need. Um, so that's in the works. We'll see what happens. But then, you know, I do fall off the wagon occasionally. Like I bought this the other day. It's the Boston Bruins 7145. Um, <laughs> but that's that was love, that's my team. I love I love how you describe it as falling off the wagon. Yeah, I love well, that's, it. that was my team as a kid. The Bruins own Boston, so okay. And and originally, this room I'm sitting in housed my music collection. Okay. So I, I that's either in storage right now, or I've already started to sell stuff off. But I had, I probably had fifteen thousand different pieces of music at one point. Wow. And uh, you don't need to do it. You don't. You don't need that anymore. You can just pop it on your phone. So I don't. You know, I'm going to keep a few things. I'm going to sell the rest, but. It's funny that collector mentality, yeah. regardless of the medium that you're applying it to, right? Records, comic books, Pokemon, sports yeah. memorabilia, sports cards, whatever. It's just either either you have it or you don't, right? right. Beanie like, Babies, pick your thing. Yeah, right? yeah. My wife wanted me to just get rid of the stuff. And it's like, honey, you don't understand. It, it might not be worth a lot of money, but it took me a lot of time to put all that collection together. And I'm not going to just throw it away. I'll give it away. I want somebody else to have it and listen to it, but I'm just not going to throw it away. It took a lot right. of work. It took a lot of work to do it. Um, it takes a lot of work to build it, and it takes a lot of work to get rid of it right. And right. It, at least you're thinking about it, and you're doing some of the, the work now on the records or on the music stuff. Um, man, it's, it's – Part of I just, it is – I, I, I'm, Go I'm, I'm going to turn 61 in a month. So I'm on the downward pot. So, you know, at some point in the next 15 years, some of this stuff has to go. So the records have to go first. But I mean, some of this other stuff, you know, that could, there's a, let me, I could probably travel the world. There's a lot of good vacations kicking around in this room eventually. Right. You know, so. exactly. Could you, do you, do you have, is it where you might go, okay, I'm going to sell, because you've probably got multiples of different items, you know. Some that stuff you, I do, yeah, yeah. 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 I'd be like, okay, I'll get rid of the stuff I have 12 of or five of or two of. Yeah, yeah. I uh, well, Two weeks ago, I got asked to go to the Worcester Red Sox game and set up, not to sell, but just to show part of my collection. I want to have Red Sox memorabilia to see. I was one of like six guys that got invited to go to this. So I had to go buy cases to put my stuff in because I didn't have any of that. And now I was going to buy the case, do the show, and then return them. But it's like I have extra stuff now. So I'm thinking that my buddy also sets up. He runs his own show. I might try to start selling some of the extra stuff now. You know, I'd rather dump, you know, a bunch of cards, save up some money just to buy one one new thing that I want and get the cards into somebody somebody else's hands, you know. They're just, yeah. just the extras, just the extra stuff. So I, I totally get it. I finally got there, you know, myself and have enjoyed it. And I'm not missing the stuff that I've been selling. Now, once um, you started selling it, it was a, became a little easier. 
to oh yeah. yeah totally i think once uh, i sell the first couple things then maybe you know the dike's gonna break and then i can you know it makes it a little easier i think we all have untouchable things yes right yeah. yep. and and i certainly do um and i i had to come to grips that me starting to alleviate myself of some of the excess and just stuff that was that wasn't as meaningful didn't make me any less of a collector right it, it you know i was downright a hoarder right i didn't sell anything and then it's like well wait a second i mean because my original goal for selling was to buy a delong well right yeah. problem solved with the grail collection uh yeah. and again for those of you that haven't seen any of that on video it's on youtube it's on my regular YouTube channel, baseball collector, shameless plug on my own channel for my other channel. Go but, watch it. It's very cool. It's very cool. Yeah. There's two things. One, just me talking to the guys that I did it with. And then uh, we did a live stream where we showed a lot of different stuff. Could heart, no way we could show it all, but uh, it was, that was probably top three hobby days in my life. You know, what you did show was pretty damn impressive. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> again, we, we just scratched it, man. We just scratched the surface of what was no, that's, there. That's very cool. I'm happy for all you guys. That's that's a big, big deal. And you well, spread it it great. Out, so, yeah. One of my favorite parts about it was John getting to fill so many set needs that he loves, you know, and that was all he wanted. Out of, like, dude, just give me a bunch yeah. of cards. He ended up getting a ton of cards, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think he's happy with that arrangement. And oh, yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, he started the ball rolling, so, you know, he's the important cog in the whole wheel, so. He's the critical cog in the whole wheel. Yes. None of it happens without John Keating. Right. Uh, and him having the foresight to go, hey, uh, and it wasn't even that he we were going to do the deal. He just wanted me to get the, the long. Like, hey, mm -hmm. I want you to get this one card. Right. And then he's like, yeah, it's, you know, the card shop owner, he's like, <laughs> I want to, I think we could handle this better is basically how I'll, I'll say it as nice as I can. And turns out we could, and we yeah. are. So worked out good. Worked but out. Uh, back to Red Sox craziness. Um, what's great about the Red Sox, I think, and again, this is from a non Red Sox guy, but as much as I hate the Yankees, I appreciate and respect what they have meant for the game. That can also be true. It's 100% true for the Red Sox, especially yeah. their incredibly long history. Certainly some dark decades, no doubt, but welcome to being a major league franchise. The only franchise that doesn't have that is the Yankees. Everybody else has, yeah. it's been a long, think about the Reds and the Indians and the, you know, I'm yeah. just thinking of long-term teams. Uh, they all go through periods of not success, but the Red Sox are, me baseball royalty i've been to fenway once uh it is an absolute dump and it is wonderful like it is it is yeah it's the seating's really screwed up but when you walk in the concourse and then walk up the steps to go to the field i was talking about one of my workers went uh this weekend it's just you get goosebumps doing it every time been there 200 times or more just it's just the feeling it's an old ballpark squeezed into a city block and it's a it's a great place to just go watch a game it's fun. one of the smartest decisions my wife and i made was the day of the game that morning we did the tour did the and tour that's cool yeah yeah twelve dollars for something cheap like yeah heck yeah we'll do that and uh so we did the tour got to sit in the williams seat you know the pesky pole the yeah all of it that? got up on yeah. top of the green monster you know and got to go up to the that's right when those seats had been created you know so that was yeah. what, i haven't been up there yet i haven't sat there i haven't i mean i only did it for the tour right uh right. but going down into the bowels of the ballpark and i mean it's just it smells terrible and it's wonderful it's like but it's also a fragrant aroma of a ballpark you know it's this yeah weird like it yeah there's I'm nothing like it. like it it's a absolute paradox that yeah. something that dilapidated in a, in a sense is also quite wonderful and absolutely what I love doing it. I loved being there. I love, I would, I, felt... I lost you. I can't hear you. Sorry. I got you. I, 
I felt completely cramped in the seats, you know, and boxed in and yet had the time of my life. Some so. of the seats aren't even turned right. So that you, you don't even, you know, oh. looking at the mound, you're looking at left field or right field. Yes. Um, and every, every, every ticket should have obstructed view on it. Um, right. Because dang near every seat's obstructed view. I, my, the pole in front of me was right on the pitcher's mound. So okay. I couldn't see the pitcher yeah. at all. I probably sat I was having to turn. I've sat in the same one probably. Um, I was there for that wild card game a couple of years ago with the Yankees, Red Sox, and it, it felt like the place was going to fall down. It was just loud from one, first pitch, and the place is so damn old. It was the place felt like it was shaking. It was just it was impressive. It was fun. I remember they hit a, the Red Sox had a sack. I don't. They were playing the A's or somebody. You know, not neither team did I care about in terms of the actual game. Uh, result, but somebody the Red Sox hit a sack fly, and you'd have thought, I mean, the people were going nuts. And I'm like, in Texas, that would get like a golf clap, yeah. you know, like good job. There, they went ballistic, they scored a run, and they were going nuts. And I just found that fascinating singing Sweet Caroline at the seventh inning stretch, all, all the things that make Fenway amazing. Yeah, I, I think the fans, they're pretty knowledgeable type fans. I was there years ago, and I remember. And it was never announced, but Reggie Jackson was his last time he was going to be in Fenway. And everybody just kind of figured it out. And when he ran to uh, right field at the end of the game, he got a standing ovation. And nobody said anything. The fans just knew it. They just knew it was going to happen. And it's a similar thing uh, when Ricky Henderson played for us for one year. And he didn't start the first couple games. But then there was a game, maybe the third or fourth game of the year. Somebody got let off with a hit. And everybody in the stadium knew, okay, Ricky's coming out. Everybody knew it. And obviously he came out to pinch run. And it's nice. yeah, the place went crazy. <laughs> For a guy they used to hate and jeer and right. But you know, they it, just figured it out. Hey, this he this is gonna happen. He's really on our team now. And the place, you know, just little things like that. I mean, it's a fun place to go. Even even though even if you sit next to a Yankee fan or a Met fan, it's still a fun place to go. You know. So with all the stuff you've collected, I I want to ask you a few trivia questions and just or not trivia about your collection and, and yep. see where you land on this. Who would you say are the top five Red Sox of all time based on what they did as a Red Sox? Uh, Ted Williams. Okay. Number one. I, I think number one. Um, Ortiz. It's either him or yes, but Ortiz, he just came through too many times in, in those world series. Then I would go with Yaz. Uh, the next, uh, Pedro. He was just electric. You, he was must much see TV anytime he pitched. Um, uh, who do you lump in after that? There's a lot of guys. Um, maybe, uh, well, I like Jimmy Fox, but, uh, he spent more time with the A's than the Red Sox, but as far as my collecting goes, maybe Tris Speaker. I'll, I'll throw him in number five. Okay. I was going to ask where Speaker fell in that. I think. I mean, if you look, Speaker's got to be one of the top two dead ball era players, doesn't he? Or three, Wagner and Kopp and Speaker. You know? Hornsby, maybe. Yeah. In your war thing, how high is Speaker? He's got to be up there. He's oh, he's like five or six, third, right? third yeah. or fourth. Yeah. And war per plate appearance, he's way up there. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I would go with those five. It's yeah, tough it's, to pin it down to five. It really, especially with the such long history, it's easy to pick the top five Rangers. They've only been around since '72. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. But okay, in your collection, what are the five? Or I don't know if I want to even put a number on it, but you're kind of favorite items, not necessarily most valuable, but stuff that you just go, I can't believe I own this. Uh, I have a, I, I always pick this as number one. I have a, it's a, uh, the 67 series was sponsored by Chrysler and they gave out these little cars to scouts, front office, and one dealership in each city got one of them. I have one on the shelf from the world series. So that's just a cool item. It's not a card. So if we stick with cards, um, my Williams rookie is probably right up there. That was, I remember the day I bought it. 
Um, the I have a Cy Young fan craze, which is a very pretty card. I remember that day I got that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the plaques, the Topps plaques. They came out in 68. They're actually little plastic things. Okay. The Topps put them out. But there's a checklist, and it's very rare, and it's very cool. Um, they made one for the American League, one for the National League, so it's just loaded with guys. So that, that's one. And then uh, I got to say my Jimmy Fox DeLong. Not, it's not even a Red Sox guy, but it's one of my favorite cards. And uh, I can just I can change my mind as I look around the room. <laughs> One of the other things I like is the transagram cards that came on the little boxes. Yep. I have, I have full boxes, the triples and the singles, but I actually have the store display, the transagram on my shelf over here, which I've only seen one other one. Um, it has every guy on it. It's just the whole store display where you would pick those boxes up. So those are the top ones for today. If you talk to me tomorrow, I have a different five probably. I actually love that if I talk to you tomorrow, it would be different. <laughs> Um, when you have so much, how many would you guess how many individual Red Sox items? Oh my god, do you own? Do you uh, do you track it? Do you no, I have don't. an inventory or is it all up in your head? Well, it's easier to figure out what I don't have than what I do have, sure. So, um, I don't track it through the you know a, a website or anything like that. I still have old handwritten notebooks, some of them I've had since I was 12 years old. I still have those with handwritten checklists on them. Um, but I don't track it. I don't do it. I, I, I can't even imagine what I have. Um, cause I have, like I said, I have a six inch binder full of pocket schedules with there's probably at least 2000 of them in there. I have probably four or five, five inch binders full of just team issue postcards from all different years back into the thirties. Um, it, it's impossible to figure out what I have. Um, it's mostly cards, but I have a little bit of everything. As long as it's how, old. how do you store all this? Do you have binders for all the cards? Do you put them in boxes? What do you do? A little of both. Um, I have a lot of binders. I have a lot of stuff on display. If I spun this around, I have a lot of stuff out. Um, 360 degree Red Sox, right? It is. It is. Maybe at the end, I'll spin it around. Um, okay. I do have a bunch. I have a closet over here that's filled with uh, just boxes. Those are mostly the complete sets that I don't even look at. And then I have uh, I have the shoe boxes full of, you know, I put them in uh, card savers by team, by year. And uh, most of the stuff that's in the binders is actually most of the oddball type stuff. I actually enjoy stuff that's different sizes. Okay. I, have a pile, I have a pile right here that's all different pages for all the different stuff. And I, I enjoy actually putting in stuff that's weird sizes anybody can buy a regular card but right you, know, you put a red man in one thing you put um you know the highest root bear with the tab on another thing i just and i'm probably i might be the least ocd collector that you'll you'll know because all my binders look different i don't all my grading comp I don't have PSA just like you. I have everything in here. And it's all mixed and matched. And that's just how I like it. Um, it's the ultimate different. Frankenstein. The ultimate Frankenstein yeah. collection. Yeah. I, I don't mind that at all. And it's opposite. Um, during the day, I'm very, I run my own business. I'm very organized. And I'm the complete opposite than I am with this. And maybe that's for a reason. I can just relax and let it flow and just do what I want to do. And that makes sense. I mean, if you're stressed out at, or not stressed out, but just, you know, focused on being, you have to stay organized at work 20, you know, you have to be very yeah. uh, particular and precise. That's an area of your life. You can, like you said, let it go. Yeah. And, so, and less so. yeah. I have a lot of stuff displayed, but um, I move it around. Uh, and I, if I get something new, that's cool. I'll add it and I'll take something off. And my room's in flux right now. Cause I had, I have a little, I have an old turntable over here that's going to go and I got to put a glass cabinet. I don't know if I'm going to build it or just, just buy one, but so I'm going to add, add a few more things. Um, I've pretty much maxed out the space that I have. So I only have, this room's only 10 by 12. So. Yeah, you What's the something. admission charge to see the room? Cause I know Keating, John Keating really wants to come to see the room. So he's, he has an invitation to come up. Um, 
Mike from Junk Wax, he, he's had, has an invitation to come down. We don't really live that far apart. Um, there's been a few guys that have come over. Um, and what I want to do, I want to get like a, uh, there's like a Norman Rockwell post that has like Ted Williams on it. I want to get that and everybody who comes just signs it. But there's already been three or four people in and they didn't do it. So I'll have to figure out how to get that. But if anybody's in the Boston area, hit me up. I will bring you over. You so do you, over. all right, let me ask you this. I'm, I'm trying to think the connection between vintage and modern. So the modern stuff that comes out, that's either reprints or a tops card that shows a Ted shows Ted Williams in 2023 mm -hmm. um, from his old days, or even the stuff that came out, the upper deck stuff that came out with Ted Williams. Like, do you go get that stuff too? Or is it, it's gotta be from the era in which the player played. How do you feel about that? I, I did buy the Ted Williams stuff. Cause I just thought that was pretty unique. Um, if I will, put together my team set still and if that ted williams card is part of just the regular set i will i include it i don't chase it a lot of times people send it to me so i have it um i do the flagship i buy a team set archives stadium club and heritage okay and all the other stuff i'll just pick off a card or two here or there and usually by the end of the year i i, I end up with all the sets anyway for people sending me stuff because i just I mean, I, I mail out stuff all the time to buddies of mine and they just mail stuff to me. So, and if I have extra Red Sox stuff, what I used to do is I used to bring it to my grandson's little league game and give the cards away to kids on the team. And they thought that was cool as hell. Even if it's junk wax to us, it's still a 30 year old card to them. So, yeah. so I, I don't chase um, non playing days cards of um, the guys I collect. But I say that I end up with a lot of them anyway. Right. And, I mean, I, and that's fine. It's fine. I look around my room here and I've got Ted Williams back there leaning against the green monster, a signed lithograph. I've yeah. got Kari Stremski right here. I've got uh, Ted Williams right here. Here, I'll pull this off the wall. Let's see. Well, maybe not. It's stuck there pretty good. Uh, it's the old Upper Deck All Star Heroes Fan Fest. It's the eight by ten or six, yep. eight, yeah. whatever yeah. it is, signed by Williams. Um, like I love Ted Williams. I think he was amazing. I think uh, Speaker and obviously Cy Young played for him. Ruth played for him. You yeah, know, there's so many amazing. Yastrzemski was. I think Yastrzemski is one of those guys that I think more people collect Yastrzemski out of the. You know, I think Mantle and Yastrzemski might be the, maybe Mays, yeah. but Yastrzemski is highly collected. He is. He's very highly collected. I, I have a Nolan Ryan plate up on the wall, just just because I, I do. I have a Mantle one up on the wall. I have a Babe okay. Ruth one, just the plates. Sure. So, I mean, I like baseball history, too. Um, and it, my collection isn't just, just all Red Sox. Like I said, I do some Braves, and I just do New England baseball in general. So I have a bunch of Cape Cod League baseball stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. Um, I go down there every summer and watch games. So I have hats for those guys. I have all the programs. They put out cards, rosters. I've been to the All-Star game. I just got – there's a game ball from a Cape game right here that I got years ago. Um, so I have stuff like that. Um, and I collect guys who are from New England, even if they didn't play for the Red Sox. So I'll do some <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, I gotta keep I gotta keep adding to it, you know. Um, there's certain sets that don't have any Red Sox player in it, and I will find a reason to find a guy, you know, I'll pick off a Cincinnati Red set because Bill Werber played for them and he played for the Red Sox in the 30s. So I'll grab has some kind of connection to it. Yeah, it's like there's never an end, right? There's no, no. and I've been thinking about that a lot. Like, what's the end? And I have this, you know, master checklist of things and I'm sure that if I got ever to the end of it, which is not likely, um, hell, I'm selling some cards from the Grail collection that are on that list because I can't yeah. afford to keep them. You can't and, do it all at uh, once. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's this never ending search, which we all love about the hobby. That's kind of the whole point. And then the people, right? I mean, you, I, you mentioned earlier, once you found, people that wrote about the hobby and then you 
started getting into YouTube and Twitter and different social media outlets, did it, how did that expand like your view of the hobby when you started getting into that stuff? Well, I mean, the first thing that hit me was like, like I said, there's guys my age that do this and they're really into it. Um, not just into baseball, but I think the relationships I've built through social media, YouTube, Twitter, um, I'm a member of Saber as well. And I, I, I found that organization through Twitter and, uh, I've been to some of those events. I've been, uh, I go to Cooperstown every year. There's a group of us that go and we just met on Twitter. Just one, two years ago, we had 22 people to show up. Some of them I'd never met before. Now I trade with them. I talk on the phone. A couple of guys are going to stay at the house and we're going to meet here and travel out. Um, that's the fun part is meeting people. And if, you know, giving cards to people to complete a set or just to help somebody out. I have stuff here that's got to get mailed up and go go out soon. That's the fun part, you know. It totally you go to is. The show and you buy stuff because you know other guys need it. You know? Right. You know, send them a text. Do you need this? That's that's the fun part. I think you know. Yeah. You find out what other guys collect. Um, that's that's what it's all about. The camaraderie, the the search, the the friendship. You know, it's that's it's well worth it. The one time I went, to, I've only been to Cooperstown once, which is crazy for a guy who loves the Hall of Fame as much as I do and everything associated with it. But we flew into Boston and we drove the Mass Turnpike all the way out, yep. took that straight west and then kind of went up. It was gorgeous. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. I couldn't believe how once yeah. we got out into the country, so to speak, in the countryside, it was breathtaking. It's it's a nice ride, and I, I can get there in four hours. Um, I have a funny story. Like my wife, my wife and I, we always used to go to the Cape Memorial Day weekend. And one year, we decided not to go. And I said, "Let's go to Cooperstown." She had no idea what it was. I said, "It's it's in New York. You'll love it." So we hop on the pike and we start driving. And she goes, "I thought we were going to New York." She's thinking New York City. I go, "No, no, no. We're going to the New York that looks like Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont." And I already had it all set up. She, I did all baseball. It was a Hall of Fame Day weekend, not the induction, but when they go, they play the game and they raise money for the Players Association of Retired Guys. And I had it all set up. I had, I had a, a winery for her. I had uh, everything set up. She had a blast. Yeah, and I, Julie, I could my wife Julie says that of all the places she would go back to Cooperstown first. Yeah, um, there's plenty to do besides baseball there. There is, and it's and, just. It's, beautiful lake you can take a boat ride it's, it's beautiful yeah uh all of that the winery the brewery the there's just so much to do. and we stayed at a, one of the air you know bed and breakfasts that were there the cooperstown inn is what it's called where we stayed and and she would sit and sip coffee and i'd go to the hall of fame right when they opened you know during the summer yep. they're open extended hours and no one was there and I would leave in the middle of the day and she and I would go toot around and piddle. And then I'd go back at night when no one else was there. And yeah, there's some nice restaurants there. The, uh, yeah. the only, well, it wasn't, it wasn't even a bad thing. She said, I get to pick where we stay. So we stayed at the Oda Saga, which is the place in town. Oh yeah. And the cool thing was we're checking in and the guy right in front of me, I'm looking at him like, I know who the hell that is. It was Alan Trammell right in front of me. <laughs> I look behind me, Trevor Hoffman standing right behind me. I go get a coffee and go to sit down. Raleigh Fingers is sitting. I had to ask, can I sit next to you? And, you know, we sat and talked for five minutes. But you walked around that hotel all day long. Goose Gossage was in the elevator with us. My wife said, who's that guy? Tim Raines. It was just loaded with people. And, you know, it was fun. They were just, they're just normal guys in, in there. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The whole, the whole, awesome. city, the whole town is magical anyway. It's just, I mean, I go every year. She goes, How does the hall doesn't change that much. I'm going, but you still get to go look at baseball stuff. It's I I never saw, I was there for four days and I didn't see even close to everything. Yeah. Um, I thought about going back this year for Beltre's induction because he's one of my guys. I yep. love. Oh, he was a, he was a Red Sox too. I can't believe we let him go one year. Yeah. I love the guy. I love the guy. And he came to us and cemented his Hall of Fame career. Yeah. So, yep. but uh, there's just. It's it's a magical place. I can't wait to go back someday. I want to go back, but I'm jealous you get to go that you decide to go every year. I'm 
Yeah, we make a trip. We make a point. It, it's always just guys we've met on uh, guys or girls that we've met on uh, social media. One cool thing we do is uh, we we rent a room at one of the hotels, and everybody picks up a box of junk wax, and we just pass packs around. And I end up with all the Red Sox cards, but you know, we, and we bet on you know, like who's going to get the. We pick one guy to see who gets picked the most. I think it was. Uh, it was Ripken this year. Whoever whoever got the most Ripkins got like a we had a little door prize. But it's just it's just the laughs and opening junk wax having yeah. a few beers and having pizza. It's fun. Someday in I think twenty one forty two, they're gonna run out of junk wax and uh <laughs> yeah. There will be no more. Yeah. Well, Mark, thanks so much for sharing part of your story and coming on and just talking hobby with me. Uh I really appreciate it. And it's been a long time coming and we yeah, finally, yeah. I mean, we talked about shoulder surgery before we talked about cards. So, that's uh, true. <laughs> true. That's true. But, uh, really appreciate you. Your knowledge is amazing. Um, I know you don't do content, but someday we're going to try to get you to well, do it. I mean, you can see, I have Mark Coyle's impossible dream. So that's a start. At least I have a name. Um, right. I keep saying I I'm going to do this. And I, I want to, if I do it, I want to have it scheduled. So I do it. And I, I have six kids. I have eight grandkids. So my life is constantly changing and I'm self-employed. My days could be eight hours long. They could be 12 hours long. So I think within the next six months, you'll see me on YouTube. Well, that I would be a good day. Count me as one of your first subscribers. I'll be All there. Right. And, uh, that. Thanks again, uh, Mark, and everybody, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'll be in Strongsville this weekend, so I, I hope to give a report next week's episode to be a report of that and maybe have some guys that were there. But uh, you, will you be at Strongsville, Mark? I won't. No, no. The big there show here the weekend Fox. after that. Um, so okay. I'll, I'll have a big show in Boston the week after Strongsville. But if you guys are going to go live and stuff, I, I'm glad I'm going to watch it. You know, I'm sure well, you I'm sure exactly. we'll be doing something, but yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. And keep collecting. See ya.